so I'll, I'll just start in by introducing Robert Zoll is a very good friend of donor concierge and an excellent attorney who specializes in reproductive law. Um, I'm Michelle, by the way, I'm, I'm work with donor concierge and Gail and the team. Um, and we like to do these webinars because it's really good to introduce people in our community who know a lot about what they're doing because reproductive law is very, very different to other kinds of law that you might um, you might and other kinds of lawyers you might need so so Rob um, I'm just gonna talk about your uh, your um, credentials you're licensed in Nevada New York New Jersey and Utah correct correct and tell me your American Bar Association family law assisted reproductive technology group what does that mean um, I think it's just, just said a minute ago it's not a type of law that uh, everybody practices um, it's it is a specialty and so you want to you can't be siloed in this in this field you have to open yourself up be part of different organizations not just to learn best practices but to see what's on the horizon um, the aba provides a great avenue for that from an inter attorney point of view so we can sit around and think about worst case scenarios and get all sorts of depressed and then on the other side there's seeds which is a pluralistic organization uh, of legal professionals mental health professionals agency owners um, and other folks in the industry. And that's where we get to be happy and we get to hear all our success stories and things like that. And then ASRM, that's the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And that's the largest organization, uh, the sort of largest organization in the US um, dealing with the medical aspects of infertility. And they realize that even their work is, uh, it goes across disciplines. So they have a legal professionals group, a mental health professionals group, and it allows us to interact with the doctors and. Um, Hopefully, we don't embarrass ourselves with the you know with a little bit of a biology we know, but um, we get to learn about that side of the of the practice as well, the medical side a little bit. Great. Okay, let's jump right in there. So we want to know what's the latest on modern sur surrogacy law in the U.S. So I would say modern sur I would define modern surrogacy law, at, with one exception that we'll see in a second, as a state that's adopted a statute. Which, uh, and if we're gonna see, if we change the slide, we're gonna see, start seeing some statutes, some of the, I'll call modern statutes. They have a lot in common. Uh, the first start, the first day to start the trend was California in 2012. They're really considered the, um, they have really have aspects, the gold standard. Oh, one thing, disclaimer. Um, I'm not admitted in all the states we're gonna be talking about. This is, uh, the information I'm providing here is of, uh, general advice and it's not meant to be specific to your specific to your situation nor is it to uh, meant to form any attorney client relationship um, I'm also not in the areas that um, I'm not admitted uh, to practice you should certainly reach out to a lawyer that's admitted in those areas um, California is the gold standard um, and we'll get to the what they have in common in a second and second Nevada came a year later and Nevada really their statute is almost a mirror of California's. Um, Nevada also has had some interesting amendments, which we can talk about in a few minutes. That's made it, made it even more friendly than Nevada. We've had New Hampshire, which before this, um, you were able to do surrogacy, but it was not as easy. Uh, the District of Columbia, where it was not, where, where again, um, it was a hodgepodge of things that let it happen. Maine, uh, up until 2016, there wasn't a lot going on in Maine at all. Um, if we go on, we see here just in 2018, we've had four more jurisdictions go online. Washington, which I know several people who are involved in the fight there, and that, again, took a hodgepodge and made it into, um, uh, we'll get to the next slide, what they have in common. And I'm just gonna say, I know we have some of our industry um, partners on this webinar, which is great, and some of them are in Washington, so um, we're really excited about that at Donor Concierge because we can start finding surrogates in Washington State as well, so. And the, and the same with Vermont, and I think mm -hmm. the, I left, you know, the, to me, not only because I'm admitted in New Jersey, but New Jersey is, a, is the first state in a while where we've overturned a ban. Um, right. If anyone's old enough to remember, there was a case called Baby M back in the 80s. And, Absolutely, um, yeah. It was when surrogacy was really new, and um, the judges didn't really know what was going on. So instead of trying to tackle what people were doing, which is building families, they just said, we're going to ban surrogacy and we're right. not gonna recognize those contracts as a matter of, pu of public policy. So if you were living in New Jersey, you had to go, so you had to, you had to go somewhere else and have that additional cost potential. Um, Iowa is interesting. It's the only one in the last couple of years where we had a state Supreme Court, not a statute, recognize, uh, recognize uh, gestational surrogacy. 
Um, and a lot of the states that we haven't listed here, it is, uh, it is permitted. For example, one I know of is in Colorado, where it's, where it's state Supreme Court decisions that have um, allowed gestational surrogacy contracts to be upheld. Um, in, my, in my personal opinion, I like practicing where there's a statute. If mm -hmm. there's certainly nothing wrong where you, if your surrogate or your arrangement is in a state where it's a Supreme Court decision or some other court decision that allows it to happen, I personally like the additional protection of the statute, especially in dealing with international parents. Because um, if it's a state Supreme Court decision and it's international intended parents, versus domestic attended parents, a court might see that very differently. So I'm gonna stop you right there because I'm confused. So when you say statute versus what, because there's some states, for instance, that are there any laws at all, like Utah, or what happens if there's no, there's no, nothing on the books? So Utah is an example I'd call a less modern statute. It's patterned over, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's patterned after a previous version of what's called the Uniform Parentage Act. And it's written much more like an adoption statute. Okay. And um, one of the things, for example, is uh, it doesn't, it still uses the term husband and wife, uh, not, uh, not partners. So there is some ambiguity whether uh, Utah might be the right uh, jurisdiction for you if you're an LGBT parent. Right, uh, right. So it, what you're saying is it depends on your personal situation, where you live. There's a lot of things that go into choosing the right state, correct? Correct. Just like, just one of the things that you have to look at when you're looking for a surrogate is where is that surrogate? There's, it's, it's uh, a skin to real estate, location, location, location. You might find a great surrogate, but if she's in a state, if she's in, and we'll get to it a little later, a state that's much, much harder or impossible to do, um, Arizona, which is not impossible, but difficult, New York, um, you might, that might be more work than you're willing, than you're able to do. It might be closed to you completely. There are some places where you have to be a domestic, um, you have to, the, in states where there's not a statute, um, the court might give you an issue if you're an international intended parent. Right, okay. Because they might say, this is something else, or this is not what we had in mind with our previous rulings. Um, I think that you, I think that the parent, the family would still be created, but it would be certainly more trouble than anyone would need. So the thing that I like with the statute, especially dealing with LGBT parents and, inter and uh, international IPs, is that there's that certainty that we know exactly what we're going to do. And if we do those things, parentage is guaranteed. Okay, let's go back to what they have in common. What okay. do all those, so we've got, I'm going to go back to those slides. So California, Nevada, New Hampshire, District DC, Maine, Washington, Vermont, New Jersey, Iowa. What do they have in common? Okay, so first, all the statutes require a medical evaluation. A lot of people think, oh, it's so, it's so easy to get a surrogate, and you can, and, uh, and you can you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's, all, there's only so many people that want to be to give the gift of surrogacy, and then of that, there's only a small percentage that actually uh, qualify. You know, right. the agency Absolutely. And one of those things is, is, a medical, is a medical evaluation. That's not only to ensure that the carrier is going to be a good match, but also that the IPs have a medical evaluation, and they're also a good match. Um, another thing is psychological evaluation, that the parties, um, that, the, that, that everyone has an opportunity to speak with a mental health professional and see if this is the right fit for them. I think it's critically important to do this legwork beforehand mm -hmm. because obviously no one wants to be halfway in the process and have some questions and have some doubts. Um, so is this written into the statutes of these? So these all the states? statutes require, every, all, the statu all the statutes require medical evaluation. Mm -hmm. Um, most everyone I know I practice with also reads that as a medical as part of this as part of medical is a psychological evaluation. Right, right. And I don't know an agency that wouldn't, uh, an agency, and I don't know a clinic that would allow a person to proceed without a psychological evaluation. I agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, additionally is that there has to be a written contract and it's not just that it's a written contract. It's not, we're going to download a template or we're going to go to legal zoom and we're pretty much happy with each other and we're going to sign it. It's a written contract that has to be drafted by an attorney and both parties, being the intended parents and the gestational carrier, have to be represented by independent counsel. Right. So you say, well, hey, I know how to write a contract. I've been in business for any number of years. Um, I believe that well, there's a lot of people that can write really good contracts out there, but this contract, the gestational carrier contract, is a special, is a special breed. It's not something that necessarily you can have experience in business law or experience in healthcare law and try to draft this on your own. 
Um, or, or if your cousin or your uncle isn't a real estate attorney, yeah, it's not the right person to review the contract. Yeah. Right? And a lot of people will say, oh, okay, well, as long as, uh, you know, and I, uh, with, with it being on both sides, that means both sides have to be uh, qualified, meaning, oh, I'm going to have, I'm, as the IPs, I'm going to have my cousin do it, and we'll get a surrogacy attorney for the GC or vice versa. I heard the GC's, I heard the GC's, you know, father's an attorney. Why don't we just save some money and have the review there? I couldn't think, um, yeah, those are just terrible ideas. Uh, even just yesterday on Labor Day, actually, I was had an evaluation with the with the with the GC, and it was her first opportunity to sit there and talk about issues that she really hadn't thought about before. Right. So it's not a matter of you have an attorney, and uh, and for both sides, it's not a matter of the attorney is retained, they write an agreement, and they never hear from each other again. A good attorney. Um, and at least I know in the states that I practice in, I, if I don't, it's not required by the statute, the court requires it, that I sign an affidavit that says, I understand, or that I believe to the best of not my knowledge, that my client understood what they were doing. Right. Um, so I have an evaluation. I've, I have, I have uh, sometimes several uh, consultations with my clients. Um, they can last they can be, you know, depending on what's what, depending on what the issues are, they can last anywhere between 60 minutes, 90 minutes, or they can last several hours if that's necessary. But it's so critically important to get that all into the written contract because if it's not in the written contract, it's not enforceable. So getting back to these, uh, what do they have in common? You know, there's a lot of talk about, we get a lot of calls from people saying, I need to find a surrogate in California because I want to do a pre-birth order. Does that mean that all of these, you can do pre-birth orders, which means, and if you sure. could define that for me as well, because there's, there's a big difference. in. I'm sense. so glad you brought that up. So a pre, yeah. so, so pre-birth order is really important because it gives that finality because without that, there's not, without that, it's going to be the surrogate mother that's going to go on the birth certificate. Now, even we can get in certain states uh, post birth orders and we can get an amended birth certificate. That's time, trouble, and inconvenience for uh, at, at, at one, at, you know, at, on one end, but even a more extreme, if you're an international IP, um, an amended birth certificate might be a real problem to retain citizenship or surrogacy in your home country. So, so, so do these states, are they yeah. pre, all pre birth order states? Correct. Wow, right. that's that's amazing. So we have a lot more options because, um, you know, as I said, there's so many people coming to the U.S. for surrogacy and California is a popular place. We have great fertility clinics here. Um, we have, you know, mental health professionals. We have lots of young women who want to be surrogates and love wonderful agencies. But, you know, there's also lots of other places that they that are possibilities as well. And it's the compensations are higher here. The agency fees are higher. So. I think, uh, you know, for us as a as donor concierge, finding surrogates in other states is this is this is great news about Washington and New Jersey and Vermont. Um, you know, in New Jersey, with its proximity to New York, that's going to be definitely a big option for people. And I think the important thing about that, you know, there's a stand. You know, there might be standard things that go in the court or, in court orders. I think the important thing to think about is. Um, if if the intended parents share different names or they're not married right. or the gestational carrier is not married. These are the things to get in a court. These are you can get things that affect this, like who's going to be in the delivery room, what name is going to go in the birth certificate. Those are all things that can be addressed in the pre-birth order. It's not simply a perfunctory device. It's something that it can be tailor-made to um, everybody's particular situation. And when do you do the pre-birth order? So anywhere between 14 and 20 weeks, we start having a conversation about it, and we like to file. I like I like to file by the by the 25th week. Um, in the jurisdictions that I, in the, in, in, that's going, that's in Nevada. Utah mm -hmm. is a little different of a process. Um, they require pre, uh, that pre validation of the, um, pre uh, 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 embryo transfer validation of the contract in order for the contract to be enforceable. So right. that's a little different. Um, New Jersey, we're also going to be doing pre birth orders. So it's going to be around the same timeline, uh, maybe a little earlier because it's just a busier court system. Um, right. And I think that's a good way to maybe enter, go into the next slide about New York. I was just going to say, yeah, we had a couple of questions. And, and please, everybody, if you have questions, you can use the function of asking a question online, and I'll try and get Rob to answer them. But we did have somebody email me some questions about New York, which I think will apply to any sort of illegal uh, states that we say are illegal states or red light states. And these are the questions that we had. Um, you know, and obviously, there's a lot of people in New York who are looking for surrogates, but um, 
Here we go. What happens? I know New York does not allow paid compensation, but does anyone know if they allow altruistic, meaning can I ask my sister-in-law and can I still get a pre-birth order? This is a great question. So we've been talking about, you've you probably heard I've been using the term gestational surrogacy. Mm -hmm. there's, for those that you don't know, there's two types of surrogacy. There's just, there's, I'm sorry, there, I'm sorry, there's a, in gestational, well, there's two types. There's gestational and traditional. Both in gestational, there's compensated and non-compensated. It's important, and this is going back to the statutes as well. All these statutes allow for, comp, for, for compensation for time, trouble, and inconvenience. Um, yeah. I know that the sums can seem very high um, for surrogacy compensation and for all the things you have to pay for expense wise. But I personally in my practice have met very, very, very few sur surrogates where the, uh, where the, where their primary motivation was the money. So right. it's pretty, so when we say we have the statute allows us to pay, it's critically important because it's a way, it's a way to recognize that they're giving of themselves and they're giving of their time. They're giving their family's time. And, you know, we can't, you know, money really is compensation. And like, this is the best that we can do. Um, but that said, within, um, there, within gestational surrogacy, there's altruistic and compensated. Altruistic surrogacy is available in New York. It's available, it, even, in, it could be potentially available in, state, in other states where just where compensated surrogacy is not allowed, but, um, but you can get an order for altruistic surrogacy. The, um, you can get, and you can, and depending on the jurisdiction, yes, you can get a pre-birth order. Okay. Um, so the okay. issue, the real issue is um, if you're using an agency, um, if, if you're using someone altruistic, so then you'd be paying, you'd have to find an agency to, uh, you could, or you could, you could, or you could not use an agency. You could use an agency simply as a concierge to manage the arrangement. Right. Which, even if it's your, something like your sister-in-law, I would highly recommend, even though it okay. does increase the cost. Um, We're going to get to that question in a minute about, okay. Terms. No but, but, okay. So you're saying that you, so an agency can, but can the agency fee be paid in New York or how does that work? So there's no agency in New York. Right. I know. <laughs> there, is, there shouldn't be any agency. In right. New York. Right. So if you're, if you're contracting, you're going to be, and I, like you said, we have industry professionals. If they have a different, a different opinion, I'm more than happy for them to pipe in um, that you're contracting in a state where it's legal that right. if you're sitting in New York, there's nothing to really be said about that. Okay. So, it's, on, it's, on, it's on compensation. It, it, the, the prohibition on, is on compensation to the surrogate. Right. And I don't know many clinics that actually would, if they knowingly go into any uh, compensated surrogacy arrangement on right. behalf of the intended parents. I mean, that's kind of... Um, okay, so how illegal is it? And will it ever become legal? There's a question. So it's been tried many. So it's been tried many times. Um, no one's been prosecuted any any, any statute in New York State. Um, um, it escapes me right now. If I know that at least one jurisdiction has a that where it's illegal. There is a there is a statute that specifically uh, that specifically makes it a criminal statute to be a surrogate. Um, so is it the the surrogate that gets? Is, is, it would not be the um, surrogate, it would be the intended parents, or it would okay. be someone involved in the arrangement. Let's say, right. going back to your example, if there, was a, um, if there was an agency in New York, that agency right. certainly could be prosecuted. Right. And I know there are a lot of our colleagues in the industry who are working hard behind the scenes to try to get it legal, legalized, and I think you know, that's another webinar altogether. <laughs> I mean, New Jersey, they tried three times yeah. over over a almost almost 10 year period. And it really took, it really took, all it took was a different governor and right. then it changed. Um, right. Other states where they, where there's much more of a quote unquote culture war, um, it might take longer. Right. I'm not sure why New York is still on the line. I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not sure why New York's still on the line, but I think with, I, if you had my opinion, the next five years, New York will also be available. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide, which is how do I choose a good state for gestational surrogacy? So. You know, there's so many things that come into play. So I could be a, an international couple or a couple that lives in, you know, Michigan, but my clinic is in Chicago, but my surrogate lives in, in um, California or, or another, Oregon. So, you know, when we're looking at a case of finding a surrogate for somebody, we're, we try to look at the whole, first of all, we engage an attorney or talk, talk with their attorney about what's a good state for them. But in your opinion, how do you decide where to find a good a surrogate? So um, I, these points here are great and we can address them in a second, but I think the best way to choose a good state is one of the first people, and I think we've talked to this before, one of the first people that um, intended parents should be speaking to is an attorney. 
Mm -hmm. Typically, an attorney is one of the last people they speak in the process. They speak to the medical professional. They speak to the psychological professionals. They speak to the agencies, but they don't speak to the they don't speak to attorneys. Um, one thing that I that I take with a, with the amount of pride is that uh, is that all parties have is that there's confidentiality, which means I'm impartial. I only I mean, which means I only represent the rights and the rights of my clients and my clients' interests. Um, and I think that's really important for people to realize that I don't, I don't have anything to sell. I only represent right. your rights. That's, that's what attorney, that's what all attorneys, all good attorneys sell. So the reason to, an attorney is to think about these things. Um, it might be whether illegality or no law. I think, I think what we're talking about here is, you know, whether you can do compensated surrogacy or not, and whether it, there's a statute or whether it's by statute, whether by court order, and does that provide certain limitations? Uh, some limitations and is, is, one, is one jurisdiction better than the other. Mm -hmm. Agency support network. Um, I know, Michelle, you probably work at agencies of all sizes, small ones and big ones, and they can all be awesome, but mm -hmm. we all have limitations. So something to think about is when you're dealing with an attorney, you're hopefully dealing with somebody with experience in third-party rejection who's seen a lot of agencies. Right. And they can tell you that's a great agency, but they maybe don't work in that state's, that jurisdiction so much. Or that's great that they have they have people on the ground, and that might mean a lot to you because you might be you being the IPs might be coming from far away, and you might right. want to you that might be really important to you. And if it's not important to you now, it might be important to you in the future. Right, right. So your does your marital status and sexual orientation come into it? So uh, it certainly does. Um, if you're, for example, Utah statute in Utah uh, would be would not be the suitable would not be a suitable place for a single intended parent. Right. Uh, but then you have places like Nevada, which anybody can become a parent. Okay. Um, we, uh, uh, for example, in Nevada, uh, one of the ways our we, our statute give uh, our statute has several ways that the con that Nevada has jurisdiction over the contract. Meaning, not even the parties don't even necessarily have to be, be residents of Nevada to avail themselves of Nevada statute. Right. Um, so that's really important because, like I said, people coming from different from different jurisdictions, international, that might be a concern. So um, basically, the takeaway is start with your attorney and they'll tell you what states are good for you, what states are green light states for you to find a surrogate, and where exactly. the surrogate resides, correct? Exactly, before you right. fall in love with any particular surrogate. Right. Uh, no okay, we have a question. Uh, I live in California and I'm thinking of having my cousin in California be a surrogate. What are the legal issues I should be aware of? So as we talk, so certainly, and I think we probably have some people on, on, online, California is a great state to do surrogacy. Um, the statute is comprehensive. And oh, it, hang on, can I, can I make a, a, a clarification? She says her cousin is in Canada. Her cousin is in Canada. Right. And her cousin's gonna be serving as the carrier. I think so, I think, sorry, I think the, the, to, the, to the, call, the caller, yes. Her, okay. I think she's so, in Canada as well, so. I so believe. I really, I, unless I, I really, unless she's going to become a legal citizen in the United States, I frown upon having um, you, having people come from foreign jurisdictions, meaning different right. countries, and coming here simply for the uh, to avail themselves of not only the law but perhaps the medical treatment. When you're in a foreign jurisdiction, especially in Canada, where um, uh, I'm not a Canadian lawyer. I know enough to know that it's complicated in Canada. Well, actually, we have a lot of clients coming from Canada to do surrogacy in the U.S. I do actually, to this um, Phyllis, we do have an attorney that I can recommend that you talk to. Um, a lot of intended parents, you know, international surrogacy in Canada. I know you're not, a, not licensed to practice there, obviously, but um, there are a lot of people doing that um, because it's cheaper. Um, in terms of being a cousin, like a family member though, say you're using a family member, what are the legal issues, whether they're in Canada or so California? There's no, concern, there's no concern, there's no concern, at least in, in, in the statute we talked about, that there's an, that they're a cousin, a sister-in-law, et cetera, et cetera. That's not an issue. And keep in mind, there's also no genetic connection. So, so, that's, so that's really why there's no issue. Um, my concern is always, Though, while uh, let's say in California, you, you can get an order in California. Um, right. Once, if something goes, if something has to be enforced, the surrogate is in a foreign jurisdiction that doesn't have to recognize a California's court order, a California court order. Right, right. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on to the next because we're actually almost done. Oh, wow. 
And we've had only just started to, uh, you know, go over all these things. Common questions. When should I begin speaking with a lawyer? I think we basically, that's the first call, correct? Correct. Okay. If we're doing an independent surrogacy, and this touches on um, the previous uh, attendees question is, do I still need a lawyer if I'm using my sister or my cousin or my- 100% absolutely, yes. Both you, both, both you and your sister who's serving as, or your cousin who's serving as an independent legal counsel. Actually, I, would, I skipped ahead to family members as surrogate. Going back to independent surrogacy. So I belong to lots of Facebook groups. There's all kinds of people trying to match independently and meet like that because they want to avoid agency fees. You know, we always advocate to use an agency and that is because then everybody's it's taken care of and there's an intermediary to help with the all the issues to it, just summarize to me what you think about independent surrogacy arrangements and can they be done successfully um they can be done successfully i've done them in the past i really and because i've done them that's why i know i don't i'm not in love with them one yeah. is an, one people really lean on their attorneys for things and I have, a, attorneys have a particular box of, special, of, 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 of knowledge, and that's not always what they're looking for when they come to the attorney. That's what the agencies provide. That's what a concierge can provide. And okay. I really, uh, people say we're gonna save money. Um, that might be a true statement, but at the end of the day, you don't wanna say, hey, we saved money. It was really difficult, but we saved, we saved some money. I think it's really worth it, and it makes all the parties comfortable and happy going forward. And there's so many, I, I mean, if somebody's insistent that they don't want to use an agency, we all, we will always say, okay, use, have your talk with an attorney and have a mental health person on board to talk with all the parties because, you know, and figure out what states are good for use. Um, but there's so many things that I've seen, I've heard that have happened that can go wrong, that it makes me very nervous when somebody doesn't use an agency. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, traditional surrogacy, just a summary of that. What about traditional surrogacy and these new surrogacy laws? They don't touch. They? Traditional surrogacy is where the, is where the, the, uh, the, the child and the carrier have a genetic, uh, have a genetic link, meaning it's her eggs. Right. And um, that is a different animal than gestational surrogacy that usually requires more of an adoption model. Okay. For, 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 what, one, the contracts are typically not enforceable. Okay. Uh, the contract is drafted, and two, uh, and two, the uh, the 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 way to, the 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 judicial way to get parentage would look much more like adoption than surrogacy. I've spoken again. You asked me in the beginning why you know why the ABA why seeds. I know there are jurisdictions that do see it differently. Mm -hmm. um, but as a, as a as someone who practices in jurisdictions that only recognize gestational surrogacy, it is a truly unique thing, and um, you can you really have to you really have to know who you're getting involved in, not only on the IP side but on your professional side. And I don't think it's as common as people think. I think that's the big myth in this field. Or when people think about surrogacy, they think about a woman actually giving up, you know, using right. her own eggs to carry the child. And in, in our opinion, we don't see that as much. I mean, there's some, I know it goes on, but um, yeah. In some circles, I've, in some circles it's more popular than other, but I agree it's not, it's certainly not a growing trend. Okay, summary conclusions. We talked about the states, the new, latest, uh, latest updates to the statutes. What's, what's next, oops. What's next is that now that it's, now that it's available, um, I'll kind of, Take this on the next end, people. To to before you get to uh, before you get to the surrogate stage, you're uh, you have to get to the creating embryo stage. Right. And there's a lot of people, uh, and there's a lot and a lot of people that get to that stage because they're so happy, they want to be parents. But there's not really a thought about it. Once we get parent, once we get pregnant, now what? Right. Um, or if we get pregnant and we have leftover material, and we get divorced, now what? So all of that is covered when you talk at the beginning and all, and all the contracts, you have all those things covered. So I certainly bring it up. And if that's something that someone wants to explore more, that's, you know, that's outside the gestational carrier agreement, but it's something that um, if the parties want to explore more, I'm certainly available to, I'm certainly available right. to do that. And I think at least people should avail themselves and give themselves some knowledge that once they're starting with one layer of assisted production, it might, uh, reproduction, it might open up another and they should think about those issues uh, well in advance.
Great. So we're looking forward to, you know, more surrogacy arrangements happening in Washington and New Jersey and Vermont, you said? Vermont. <laughs> Great. I'm sure, yeah. Okay, Rob, we're actually out of time. Um, I put a slide up for you of how to get in touch with you and it's actually the law offices of Robert M. Zoll. <clears throat> Anything else? Um, that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I'm also available on Facebook. Uh, it's the it's at sign creating your legacies. Um, okay. I have general and not only do I have uh, information about uh, third party reproduction, I also have a great news feed there if you uh, want to know what's going on in this uh, this crazy world. Fabulous, and I will send everybody who's attended a um, link to all of those things. So thank you everybody for joining, and thanks Rob for updating us. My pleasure. Thanks so much.